get started. I know there's a couple of people in the lunch line uh, still coming in. Uh, well, welcome. I'm uh, for those who are uh, not part of uh, coming from off campus. My name is John Eckenrode. I'm a faculty member in human development and associate director here in the Bronfman Benner Center. So I want to thank you for coming and welcome you to uh, BB Hall and this somewhat dreary day now. Uh, this is our first um, uh, in of our Talks of 12 series for the semester. I hope you'll take a peek at the remaining talks. Uh, we have some really interesting mix of folks coming this semester. So on your way uh, out, if you haven't already, you know, jot down the, the next ones that are coming up and we please come up if you're available uh, or come over if you're on campus. Uh, one other talk I want to uh, alert you to uh, before I introduce our, our guest today is uh, next week is the Bronfenbrenner annual Bronfenbrenner lecture uh, on the 16th, and there's a poster outside of the room if you want to get more details of it. It's uh, Ron Haskins from the Brookings Institute will uh, be here to talk about evidence-based policy. Uh, he's been very involved with that whole uh, the push within the Obama administration for uh, policies based more on research and evidence, and it's sort of putting that into practice in some ways in the policy arena in various agencies within the federal government. So Ron's been in the middle of a lot of that discussion in Washington, so he'll be here to reflect on on the success and challenges of having truly having evidence-based policies uh, take hold in the federal government. So uh, please come to that. Everyone's welcome. Uh, that's at noon over in the Biotech Center uh, on campus, and lunch will follow. Uh, so please come by if you're free to tell others as well. But today we have a special guest, uh, Barbara Genzel. Uh, uh, Barbara is uh, goes way back uh, with us uh, in the in the university, the college, and the center. Uh, Barbara was a graduate student in human development, got her PhD there uh, in developmental. And while she was a graduate student, she also worked uh, on this various projects, including some in the center. Uh, we worked together on some of the nurse family partnership work. Um, and so forth. So uh, we have uh, a, a long and productive relationship with Barbara, not just as a graduate student, but also as a colleague and, and fellow researcher. Uh, so it's great to have her back. Uh, she's been busy um, uh, since graduate school. She, she went back and re-specialized, uh, got an MSW um, in clinic, so she has a clinical re-specialization after her research degree which takes a lot of courage as well as effort to, <laughs> to go back to school at the, at the young age or whatever you are. Um, so congratulations on completing that. And uh, some of you, you know Barbara now from that world in terms of her clinical re-specialization. Uh, but let me just say that she, I mean, Barbara's contributed uh, to our fields in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, certainly as a researcher and theoretician, uh, she's done some very interesting and, and, and well-recognized work in the relationship between stress and trauma in, in the brain, the developing brain, um, and, and ran a, a, a lab uh, as part of her time at Cornell, a, a neuropsych lab. Uh, so she's a very well-regarded and well-published um, uh, well researcher in this field. So, for example, she did some interesting work after the 9-11, uh, the September 11th uh, tragedy in New York City, about the effect of that uh, major event on, on, on the brain and the stress response to the brain. So, that's just one example of some of the very interesting work uh, Barbara did as a researcher and a theoretician. She's also written some very, uh, I think, fine uh, theoretical pieces that are getting a lot of attention. Um, Marwa has also had a long-standing interest as a researcher. She's teamed up with other teams of researchers uh, looking at the uh, uh, role of stress and trauma in, in clinical populations, especially populations of, of folks with uh, autistic disorders of various kinds. And so she's had some, uh, some very good contributions in that field as well as a researcher and, and thinker. 
Um, and more recently, now she's taking the, all that experience and expertise and is applying it to uh, end of life issues and palliative care issues. And she's no, and some of you know her from her clinical uh, internship work and placements and involvement in our community with regard to palliative care and end of life issues. And that's really what she's going to uh, talk to us about today. Is actually the very great example of this sort of translational theme we like to promote, uh, because Barbara is very well grounded in the basic research of stress in the human brain and the effects of trauma on, on people, and is, is now um, has the tools and wherewithal to apply some of that uh, knowledge to uh, some specific issues around uh, trauma and, and end of life care. So it's, it's great that she's back um, and that she's going to talk about that with us. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce Barb. So. How do you do? Do people usually stand? Either whatever you prefer. Uh, I think I'm used to standing because I. Uh, I'm used to lecturing. <laughs> um, so. Um, uh, I, I counted for this talk, and I've been doing uh, research on uh, basically trauma research for 22 years, uh, looking at stress and trauma and maltreatment uh, in toddlers and adolescents and adults uh, uh, various ages, um, in, including the prenatal early infancy project, <coughs> Jane and John and, and Pam Morris. Uh, the past 10 years, I've been uh, I, I transitioned to looking at the neurobiology of stress and trauma um, using F fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and magnetic resonance imaging. Um, I wrote what's arguably the first paper uh, in 2007 on the long-term effects of stress on the brains of an exclusively non-clinical or preclinical population. There were 100 papers on the, on, on, on the effects of trauma and stress in people with PTSD. And there were, at that time, no papers on the long-term effects of stress in people that did not have a clinical disorder. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> um, so I've, I've continued to publish in that area um, while, while I'm doing, while I did the clinical re re retraining with an imaging lab in China that's working with the survivors of the Great Sichuan earthquake. Um, we're still producing papers with them. Um, Recently, uh, as John point, uh, noted, I've, I've hit a developmental turning point, uh, to use a human development phrase. Um, uh, we've had, in my extended family, um, we've had five elderly family members die in six years. I've had a direct caretaking role, the most recently two weeks ago, which is my father. I'm just coming back from six weeks in Arizona uh, with, with him. Um, uh, I've had a direct caretaking role to some extent in four out of those five. Um, our local grandmother, uh, we have two old people left. A local grandmother spent two years, in, I mean, two years, yeah, two weeks in ICU in May, uh, immediately subsequent to my graduation from the MSW program. And the other one is 95 and frail. So, okay. All right, thank you. So we're kind of, I'm, I'm at that, um, uh, so at this particular stage in my developmental tra uh, uh, trajectory, I've, I've had this set of experiences that pretty much rocked my personal and professional world. Um, and it's inspired me to do the clinical training in end of life care. And by the way, there is no PhD level uh, uh, retraining re um, in end of life care to my knowledge. Um, hospices can't afford PhD level psychologists, they hire social workers. Um, so that's where the class work is, that's, that's where the knowledge base is, something to keep in mind. Um, um, and um, my research attention has shifted to stress and trauma at end of life. So, I have some things to talk about that come from a combination of my background, my life experience, and the, the research and writing I've been doing. Uh, this talk is um, uh, based on a paper that's under review with the Journal of Palliative and Hospice Care. I think that's the name of it. Okay. 
kind of a hokey phrase, but it's important. Hospice and palliative care stands in opposition to stress, pain, and suffering at end of life. Okay? It's important. People in hospice and palliative care are mandated. You know, at least in hospice, Medicare says you assess and do, do your best to ease pain, anxiety, depression. So major depression, uh, gen, gen, generalized anxiety in whatever form you can assess it and treat it. Um, but also uh, distress due to dys dyspnea, short, shortness of breath, delirium, loss of control. Um, you know, people don't like wearing diapers. <laughs> uh, grief at the loss of your life and having people, you know, your family go on without you. Um, I will argue that there is an elephant in the living room. Hence my elephant theme for the rest of the talk, okay? Plus, well, isn't that a wonderful elephant in the living room? Anyway, so um, I'm going to give a couple examples of why stress and trauma at the end of life are significant questions. For example, um, a dear friend of mine, um, a neighbor was dying of cancer. Uh, a few hours before she died, she was literally on her deathbed. Her caregiver, who was her partner of many, many years, um, had to give her um, a vaginal suppository with pain medication. Okay, this is a standard hospice and medical approach if you have had, um, you know, if you can't take med uh, medication by mouth anymore. Um, and uh, so she was administering pain, pain medication via vaginal suppository, um, and her dying loved one called off and socked her a couple hours before she died. This was kind of, it was really hard on the caretaker. You know, it's a, it's, it's a deathbed experience. Those, those stay with you, okay? Um, and, and, you know, it was hard on her to have her dying loved one just soccer as one of the last things she did, okay? Nobody thought to ask either the individual who was sick while there was still time and she was more coherent, or the partner, if the dying person had a history of rape. Um, the combination of um, vaginal suppository, rape history, and the mild delusion that often accompanies end of life created a situation that didn't need to happen. Okay? Nobody thought to ask the question of, of how many of you who do hospice or have done ICU work, how, how many of you asked trauma histories? Not, it wasn't in my questionnaire when I was assessing people um, when, when they came, came on to hospice work. And it's not required by Medicare. It's not, people don't think about it. Okay, uh, another example was our very first dying old person. Um, our Ithaca grandpa, who was in a uh, local nursing home with a fractured pelvis. I thought that I saw in him straightforward um, symptoms of post-traumatic post stress following a really routine medical procedure. Um, these included extreme arousal, avoidance, and nightmares. Okay. These symptoms uh, came on abruptly, immediately following the, the, the procedure, which he described as intensely painful and like torture. Uh, thing was, nobody believed me. I could say, yeah, I've done PTSD evaluations and assessments for 22 odd years, okay? But I wasn't a clinician, so I became a clinician. But, um, uh, but I couldn't even get them to evaluate him themselves for post-traumatic stress. The end of this poor man's life was a nightmare of pain and fear. And in, at the time and in retrospect, informed retrospect, it was clear that this didn't need to happen. All right. 
uh, and to use an old Texas phrase, I have it written down here, is chap my butt severely. <laughs> All right? Okay. So that's kind of the preliminary. Okay. Why don't people assess symptoms of PTSD and trauma in medical patients? All right. Part of it, I think, is sociological, sociology of medicine. The DSM-3 and on, the definition of a trauma was a catastrophic stressor that was outside the range of human experience that didn't include chronic illness, didn't include pregnancy, didn't include asthma, didn't include a lot of stuff that's usual, part of a usual experience. If, so it included chronic illness, simple bereavement, a lot of stuff, all right? Um, if you haven't had a trauma, you cannot have PTSD. I mean, it, it followed. So nobody was assessing for PTSD. More recently, DSM-5, back in the DSM-4, people eased up on that. And the definition of a trauma includes threat of death or actual or threatened serious injury to self or other. Okay? It allows chronic and acute illness. So, clinicians up until recently, fairly recently, um, if one of their patients was showing signs of distress because they had end-stage cancer, uh, liver disease, um, they were dying of short shortness of breath because their lungs were filling up with air, it was an adjustment disorder, okay? I have the elephant stamping on the definition of adjustment disorder because it is marked distress in excess of what would be expected from exposure to the stressor. You're overreacting, honey. Interestingly, adjustment disorder was one of the most commonly diagnosed emotional disorders in the cancer patient. Okay? You just got to think about, anyway, what those people put up with. Is this a problem? I would argue yes, and I'm going to provide some data on that, okay? Um, first, baseline. Psychological trauma in anybody is not unusual. Tell my students that. <laughs> okay? More than 60% of men and 50% of women in a lifetime experience Ron Kessler, a psychological trauma in, in their lifetime. Okay, more than half of these experience two or more. Fewer than 8% get PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. However, trauma exposure is pathogenic in the absence of PTSD. I've written a lot of papers on this by now, okay? It's a predictor of immediate and lifetime increases in a wide array of mental and physical disorders. You have trauma exposure, you're more likely to have health problems and mental, you know, physical and mental health problems later. Hey. Um, there are significant psychophysiological effects of trauma exposure in people that do not have PTSD. This was, you know, I, I would talk to clinicians eight, ten years ago, and they'd go, they don't have PTSD. They don't have a, you know, there's, there's not supposed to be a difference between them and, you know, anybody else in the control group, okay? Um, this, uh, we have evidence now, increasing evidence, uh, this is a growing body of research, that um, trauma exposure in people who do not have PTSD uh, impacts emotion processing, some of the new work coming out of uh, China, after the Sichuan earth earthquake, really demonstrates that it impacts cognitive processing. You don't have to be aware that the trauma reminder happened. It will still impact your brain function and your response, and it impacts mental health. It increases symptoms of PTSD and future vulnerability for PTSD. If you have it, if you're exposed to trauma and you don't get PTSD, you're more likely to get PTSD the next time you're exposed to a trauma. Okay, changes your body, changes your brain. If you've been through some bad experiences, you have a sense of that. Okay? Oh, and um, 
actually what I did is I put um, as, as a citation for that uh, a paper that um, Elaine Weddington and Pam Morris and I wrote for Psych Review um, talking, you know, uh, pre presenting a model, a brain-based model for how stress impacts mental and physical health and the pathways through which that happens. And I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that later if um, uh, <coughs> we get a chance. Now, in some work that we did uh, in 2007 to 2008, this is actually from the 9-11 study. We looked at people who were close to the world, within a mile and a half of the World Trade Center when it went down versus people who were living more than uh, 50 miles away, I actually forget, um, at the time of the disaster. Uh, but then it moved back, but it moved, moved into New York City later. Uh, what we saw three years later in people who I had specifically excluded PTSD and major depression and mental health problems in general, we saw decreases three years after the mental health event across the core emotional systems of the brain, um, including the anterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex here, insula, bilateral insula, very important for people that looking at the large-scale neural networks of the brain, um, amygdala, and anterior hippocampus. Um, Importantly, all of these regions are implicated in the evaluation and the regulation of emotional stimuli in, in humans, in people that do not have post-traumatic stress disorder. <coughs> Trauma-exposed people. Have you found any functional change? This structure change? Yeah, I know. Um, that's a different paper, but yes. <laughs> um, this is easier to talk about. Uh, but, but in response to standardized emotional stimuli, um, just fearful and calm faces, we saw increased amygdala reactivity in the 9-11 exposed people three years after. So it wasn't reminders of the event itself, it was just fearful versus calm faces. Okay? So the gist of this is that stress and trauma can play a significant role in long-term health in the general population. You don't have to be... You don't have to have a disorder, and you don't even have to have been uh, trauma exposed when you were a child. It can happen anytime. Okay. Uh, this uh, we spent some time uh, developing brain-mediated models of the stress process. Our basic one uh, we we, uh, we wrote for Psych Review. Uh, Pam Morris and I. Uh, put a developmental framework on, on, on that model, and it was lead article in a special issue of development in psychopathology. Uh, we've since, uh, actually in press, Pam and I have put together um, a brain-based model of the stress uh, process that's based in a large-scale neural network to the brain. And then we have used that um, in another chapter for the Handbook of Emotions, using that to look at similarities and differences uh, between stress and emotion. So we're trying to link the stress and emotion literature uh, using our, our, our model as a platform. And the editors were really happy. So anyway, so, um, so what we have is, um, so the idea is that post-traumatic stress, even if it's not a disorder level, but post symptoms of post-traumatic stress can be significant physiologically, emotionally, uh, uh, medically in people that don't have a disorder. How this works out in medical patients is increased PTSD symptoms predict increased pain. Okay, triple people, I think that's important, <laughs> okay? So, um, it also predicts increased anxiety, depression, distrust, and anger. It severely impacts patient-staff collaboration, or it can. Uh, and um, if people have had you know, trauma reminders and they want to, you know, part, you know, one element of those symptoms is they want to avoid the trauma reminders. Uh, and so if it's a medically-based trauma, um, they'll want to avoid medical situations. 
so they may avoid medical care, which isn't so great. <laughs> what we're talking about is end of life, though. So this is a very specific population. These people are old, okay? Most of the hospice population uh, is over the age of 65, only 40% is over the age of 85. So old people, uh, they're sick. These are people who have a history of a life-threatening illness. Uh, they also, typically in the Western world, have a history of intensive medical intervention. Um, and importantly, they're dying, which means that they have a terminal illness and everything that that means in the, in, you know, to Western medicine, okay? Each of these creates unique risks for trauma exposure and the development of symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Okay, sources, just being old, all right? The older you are, the more chance you have to, to, to have lousy things happen to you, okay? You just have a longer time in order for it to happen, okay? You know, if you grow up in places that are difficult, you know, you grow up in the hood, well, okay, that'll accumulate faster. But age itself is a vulnerability factor for trauma. We know this, and um, in, in particular, as you and your cohort age, you start losing people that are important to you. Okay, you start losing loved ones, and this increases um, the possibility that, that you can, you know, that these experiences can be awful, all right? Okay, also, normal aging prompt life review. Um, it can reactivate, this has been demonstrated, there's papers on it, they're mostly out of the VA, but other people have trauma. I've made that point, right? Okay. Normal life review can reactivate old trauma memories. Moreover, so if, if, you, had, um, if you had bad bad experiences and even had PTSD, it can reactivate the PTSD. It can also, even if you didn't get PTSD the first time, you can get PTSD on the rebound in old age especially in the context of ill, of ill health, okay? So that's important. And this can result in new PTSD, even if the initial trauma didn't. These are important things to know. This is just normal aging. All right, sources of trauma, being sick. This is really hard for medical professionals, all right? Because they're helping. They're trying to do good. All right, intensive medical inter who has had intensive medical intervention? It can be bad. Okay? It can be a trauma. Um, I'm going to take some specific examples. Let's take cancer, which makes up cancer is the single individual um, uh, illness that, that is the largest in the hospice population. Okay? Um, so in 2011, cancer patients made up about 38% of hospice patients in, in the United States. Okay, PTSD symptoms. Okay, so this is just symptoms. We're not talking about full-blown full PTSD, just symptoms, because we know symptoms can exacerbate pain and generally cause trouble, okay? 20% of patients were assessed with, as, as having significant symptoms of post-traumatic stress in early stage cancer. By the time their cancer was recurrent, 80% of that population had PTSD symptoms. Post-traumatic stress is dose dependent. So people who are, I mean, recurrent cancer has a lot of accumulating bad news associated with it, okay? Um, and so it accumulates. Okay, we don't have any information on trauma in hospice populations, but you can infer that if you have 80% of those with recurrent cancer, by the time they're referred to hospice, which means they have six months, they acknowledge to have six months or less to live, uh, you can guess that at least 80% of those are who we get in hospice. Add this 
that by the time somebody's referred to hospice, they've either been forced out of treatment because they've been told that they're out of treat, treatment options. They're dealing with medical abandonment. Okay, I, you know, it's a hard thing to talk about, but even in my family, I've got family members who were treated for cancer with really good prog prognosis. Cancer teams are really good at supporting the people in their teams. Everybody I've talked to said that last meeting was the hardest, scariest time they have ever had associated with cancer. And now they're just going out in the world. You know, they've lost that basket of care that was holding arms. And hopefully, you know, hospitals will pick it up, but it's, it's hard for people. Or you've got the group who said, I'm not doing anymore. I would rather be dead than do anymore. Okay? These are people who have been pushed to the wall by what they've experienced in cancer care. Okay? I'm guessing that there's some traumatic stress symptoms in there over and above what you see in people with, with recurrent cancer. Okay. Another example, hemodialysis. Um, these are different studies, so the, the, the out, outcomes are not apples to apples, but um, in a study of hemodialysis, 80% of patients reported at least one, one trauma in a lifetime. 60% reported that their current hemodialysis treatment was the worst thing they've ever experienced. Rape, sudden death of a loved one, accidents, things like that. Dialysis topped it for, for more than half. 43% had feelings of horror expressed, despite our stoic country, um, expressed uh, uh, feelings of horror and fear regarding their treatment. And about 10% had clinical levels of PTSD. You can't say the other people aren't suffering in a meaningful way that's going to affect how they feel pain, how they react to their medical environment, so forth. Okay, critical care. Big one. Okay, critical care often involves sedation, sometimes for quite long periods of time, restraint, intubation. If you have a tube down your throat, most people want to pull it out, so they tie your hands down. Okay, uh, so intubation, light, you know, often like constant light. <clears throat> Some places now are, you know, they try to do uh, normal day-night cycles, a lot of constant noise. 80% of mechanically vented, so intubated, I ICU patients experience delirium. Turns out that delirium is a very significant predictor of post-traumatic stress. Um, delirium predicts PTSD, it predicts cognitive decline, it predicts six-month mortality. 80% um, of ICU patients in um, actually, more than one study report believing that they would be, quote, harmed, hurt, or killed by ICU staff. <laughs> I'm seeing nods, and I always see nods from somebody. If, if there's medical people around. Um, this includes rape, and it may be for the suppository. If you think about it, you know, if you're intubated, you have to have other ways of, of administering medication. If you've got enough lines in you, you know, you might go for suppository. Uh, if you're delirious and sedated, what you interpret as happening to you can get pretty weird. Um, Quite recently, 2013, uh, the American College of Critical Care Medicine has revamped ICU guidelines because the weight of evidence suggests that this is a significant problem for people coming out of ICU care. Long term, they've, they've designated a post-intensive care syndrome, uh, which includes PTSD, it includes major depression, cog cognitive declines over time, as long as they live after that, uh, neuromuscular impairments, and it predicts mortality. Um, so 
So critical care is a really, and yeah, they're trying to help, but it has consequences. The kind of care that they receive and need to receive, you know, at least within our Western medicine context, um, is, uh, uh, has consequences that are long-term. Um, there's also a massive literature on uh, in, in, in increased symptoms of post-traumatic stress with myocardial infarction, subarachnoid hemorrhage, acute leukemia, childbirth with and without intervention, and some of the childbirths that go well, to say nothing of the childbirths that unexpectedly don't go well. Uh, HIV is a big one. And any delirium, any time you have delirium, you have uh, open door for post for, for post traumatic stress. We see a lot of delirium in hospice. Um, okay, so going back to okay, we've got old people in the hospice and also the palliative care population because arguably a lot of the palliative care people uh, are in line to segue uh, in, in, into hospice even if they don't actually do it. Uh, they're old. They have personal losses uh, that are profound, reactivation of trauma memories. Uh, they're old and sick, which increases the reactivation of, of, of trauma memories. Uh, intensive medical intervention is much more likely. If you have somebody who's old and sick and dying, i.e. they're a hospice patient, um, these are the failures of intensive medical intervention. For a lot of them, you know, sometimes people say, I've got cancer, I'm not doing nothing. Most people give Western medicine a shot, okay? Um, and anybody who is a failure of that intensive medical intervention, uh, you know, it, it suggests that hospice is a locus of medical trauma and reactivated trauma and PTSD, okay? To say nothing of the loss, you know, working through the loss of your own life as you go forward, not getting to see your grandkids show up, not, you know, people still have aspirations even when they're old and sick. So what do we do with all these elephants? All right? This is not something that has been addressed in the literature. Uh, except for, there's a guy who's now doing something else, unfortunately. Uh, but he wrote a couple papers out outlining uh, the problem and, well, some of the problem. Um, and, and he suggested a stepwise palliative post-traumatic stress inter intervention, which varies, and where, where, the, where, where the intervention varies as a function of uh, how much time the patient has left and patient capacity. Not infrequently, we end up in hospice with people who got, you know, they're gonna live three days. My dad was just on hospice for 10 months that's unusual. Uh, it does happen, but um, it's more to the three days than the 10 months, okay? So if somebody's got days to weeks, this guy suggests, and, and at that time he was in a VA hospital, um, he was suggesting brief symptom respite, which is education, by and large, it's education of the medical team. You gather the data, you, you educate the medical school team about post-traumatic stress, for the patient, on the patient's behalf. You make changes for the patient to reduce symptoms. Um, so you might avoid certain medical procedures if you know, if you've asked the questions of either them or their family about their history of trauma. Uh, and you provide strong psychosocial support and reassurance. So these are all things that you simply do for the patient. It means that asking questions is going to be helpful. You know, do they have a history of rape? Do they have a history of assault? Do they have any history of trauma, which it might make them, I mean, we get some really combative people in hospice. You know, why are they combative? There's, there's, um, uh, there's thoughts on that. Anyway, um, 
if the patient has weeks to months, so, so days to weeks, you do it for them. Weeks to months, um, you, you work on education. You educate the patient, you educate the family, and you educate the medical team. You do everything in step one, but also do some work to teach the patient and the family ways to reduce symptoms. This can be relaxation, thought stopping. You know, the more cognitive behavioral techniques, mindfulness meditation, problem solving, you know, talking if they need to talk. Um, so, so the idea is to help them, you know, give them some help to, to reduce their own symptoms. If they've got months to years, um, this guy says, well, then you can use treat, treatment as usual for PTSD because they've got time, you know, and it, and it depends on the, parent, the patient capacity. Um, his assertion was that all usual gold standard trauma treatments required uh, too much cognitive ability, uh, too much time, too much homework, patients had to get worse before they get better, that they're simply not appropriate for these guys, okay? Well, I had this teacher two, two, two semesters ago. She was a psychoanalyst, I mean, a card-carrying New York City trained for forever and ever in psychodynamics and psychoanalyst Freudian person, all right, who learned to do eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, a technique that I used to just roll my eyes about, not wobble them, but roll them. Okay, because um, there didn't seem to be any any reason to think it would be useful, except that. Uh, uh, and she said, "You know what? Does the same thing as years of psychoanalysis, only a whole lot faster." And I went, "Wow!" Oh. So she made us read books and read, read articles. And with my background, then I got interested in the neurobiology behind it. And actually, the neuro neuroimaging evidence is reasonable. It's interesting, and there needs to be more papers on it, and I may have to write one, but that's later, okay? Um, so the thing about EMDR that I really got excited about is that, okay, this is a gold, one of the three gold standard treatments for, for PTSD. You have the, uh, the re-exposure where they go, go through it and go through it and go through it and go through it. You have the trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy, and you have EMDR. And the evidence suggests that in terms of effectiveness, those three are neck and neck. There's really, really good big studies that, that suggest that these three are the gold standard. Okay, evidence. It's brief and effective. Uh, the, the, the evidence suggests that it takes a lot shorter time. We don't need 16 sessions um, to have um, really good pal palliation of post-traumatic -post stress. And uh, the Humanitarian Assistance Program of uh, the EMDR International Organization sends people out to disaster areas and does single-shot EMDR focused on a single trauma and, you know, you know focused on a single event. And it's useful. And you don't have to get worse first. Very important. Low cognitive demand. You don't have to be able to process it through and, like, use thought stopping or use the directions for thought stopping, which is kind of complicated. You know, it's a metacognition kind of thing. And there's no homework. Moreover, you don't even have to describe the trauma in detail. You just have to hold the event in your mind. And if you have nightmares about it and you don't even know what it is, you can hold the nightmares in mind, okay? It's, uh, it's just a different avenue through which it works. There are modified protocols for dementia. Uh, and there's multiple formats for the bilateral stimulation. Getting people to do this isn't necessarily helpful. But one of the guys that I'm working with who's at um, Hospice of the North Coast in California, 
that taps their feet. Another guy on the team that I'm working with to, to develop these interventions for hospice and palliative care is in Kansas, and his wife does hospice, and he just, he says, she just taps shoulders. You know, she has her arms around the patient, and she just taps while they're talking about hard stuff. Okay? So there's, uh, you can do sound. Um, my teacher from two semesters ago had this little buzzer thing, and so it buzzed. All, all, alternately, at a mild buzz in each hand. Buzz, 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 buzz. Oh, tough. And then you do the processing work with them. But mostly they're doing it. Okay? This is a really cool idea. So as I've alluded to, uh, I am working, I took a break of about two months to deal with something else. Um, but uh, I've, I've been working with a team of hospice and EMD people, uh, the guy in Kansas, wrote the book on EMDR with um, Shapiro. Is this name? I don't remember. Um, with the person who developed EM, EMDR. Uh, his wife does hospice, and she has been using EMDR and integrating it into hospice work. Um, and the two other people that we were working with were in hospice of the uh, North Coast uh, in California. And we're trying to write a paper and do some presentations saying, hey, guys, this actually seems like this can work. Mostly it's case studies that, that, that we're working on in the literature. People use EMDR along with, um, say, somebody's got a history of, of really acute trauma and they're freaking out in the hospice. You use a combination of EMDR, some relaxation, uh, antidepressants and antipsychotics with pretty good you know, you know, with pretty good effects. Otherwise, you have somebody freaking out until they die, which is just bad for everybody. Future directions. Have to work on assessment, have to work on palliation of traumatic stress. I would actually argue, and I'll argue it with my team, for um, merging the stepwise, you know, the education, educate the medical team, teach um, you know, teach relaxation and, and, and ways to effectively, you know, do, do your best to control your own symptoms, but also to incorporate wherever you can actual palliation using, you know, like palliative radiation is used um, for cancer treatment in, in hospice. You can shrink the tumor. It makes people more comfortable. Okay, it's curative in another context, but in the context of hospice, it's palliative. I would argue that EMDR and, you know, in a stepwise format, you know, in, integrated into that original step, stepwise format can be effectively palliative. Ooh, good. All right. So thanks for thinking about this important topic with me. <laughs> Does anybody have questions? Yes. So in terms of assessing, is this the first meeting? Is this multiple meetings? Who's assessing and Nobody's talking about assessment just yet. Right, right now we're talking about EM, EMDR. The assessment takes people, you know, having con conversations with people who are, for example, experts in really brief, um, you know, doing brief effective assessments. Um, I think going through a 26-item trauma inventory is probably not going to be helpful. But just saying, are there any traumas in your history isn't helpful either. I've, sorry, I didn't mean to like put, put something between us. Um, I've asked people who came to a neuroimaging center for research and they were recruited because they were within a mile and a half of the World Trade Center. To ask them if they have any traumas, they go, no. <laughs> you can't just, because, oh, I'm fine. You know, they're going to say no. And somebody else with a different mindset is going to list lots of stuff. So you got you to gotta ask in, in enough detail. And the assessments that, are, that need to be developed have to be short, and they have to be appropriate for use with a caregiver. Um, 
for use with a caregiver instead of the patient if the patient is not able to provide that, that information. A lot of the patients are. You know, I've often done really clear assessments with really clear people who are also going to die pretty soon. Okay? You can have a conversation. And if you tell people, this might be important to your care, they're willing to talk about stuff. People at the end of life are willing to talk about a lot of stuff. Sometimes they weren't willing to talk about even before. Um, so assessment hasn't been started yet. It can be. You know, it's, it's a low-hanging fruit. <laughs> um, and there's expertise in this room. I can name names. <laughs> um, no, I do. I can start. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would start. Okay. I was looking right at you. Okay. <laughs> I would start with, um, I would start with, um, is your parent a veteran? Yeah. Uh, Which is a question about the question. Uh, right. Yeah. But. So, so it means you've already got part of the question. Yep. That's, yep. That's yeah. That, but any history of rape, murder? They usually don't ask that. You, know, okay. you, don't, you, don't, you don't ask that, but you might, you might say something. Was there any history of abuse or violence, even very far in the past, such as childhood? Mm -hmm. I think that takes the onus off you having to respond to like, your family. Right. But, yeah, and, and like early, early childhood abuse also, you know, a lot of people, not just women, get raped. Sexual assault and violence is important to just go ahead and ask. And, and, and the other thing I'm thinking of is, you know, how much, how much record do you have of past medical care? Because probably there's no time. There's no time. There's no. There's, no. there's no time. To, there's no time to collect that. But um, and I realize this may be unrealistic. I was just thinking through a situation with my mother where she was checked in the hospital. And they talked, started take doing a complete medical history of her with me. Even though it was in the same system, they couldn't transfer the records. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. CMC has, what, three different independent systems of information that don't talk to each some other? Way, some way to crack this nut. Yeah. It would be very helpful, right? If you think it's, if you, if you have an idea that it might have been the case. But I'll stop there. Yeah. yeah. And the, um, Fellini. Fellini? Fellini? The guy who came to Felitti. Felitti has like the three question inventory yeah. that is actually predicts a whole lot of stuff. So there's 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 things to possibly do that would at least be an improvement. Because right now people are not asking the question, except the veteran. But like my husband's a veteran, he's in the Coast Guard. You know. Not during Vietnam when it got bad. But um, you know, he was patrolling the coast, you know. He's a veteran, but uh, combat veterans a whole nother kettle of worms. Uh, God help the people who are doing hospice in 40 plus years, 50, 60. Anyway, so um, so so there's that. Um, but so no, we haven't. But the assessment piece, like I said, it's low hanging fruit, and, and it needs to be done. It needs to be piloted, um, and then it needs to be published. It needs to be piloted first a little bit, then broadly, and then it needs to be published. We got to get it out, and then we need to trot it out to hospice and palliative care um, conferences. Barbara? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Would you, would you recommend that it be part of the standard assessment? Yes, part of the Medicare standard. You got to do it, or you don't get Medicare funding assessment. If just asking is going to do it, so is the vaginal suppository. <laughs> you know, so so just asking is going to do it, then it's close enough to the surface so that any medical intervention might tweak it off too. Janice? I'm just wondering if, so, if you know, the, the percentages are so high, maybe it makes sense to assume that there's some trauma in the, in the background and not necessarily have to assess the 
possibly triggered because it's not even sure how we can know if a reaction to a, a suppository is necessarily linked to a past sexual assault. So does it, how important, I guess, is it to know the details of trauma? And if we just start assuming that most people are likely to have some trauma and, and have all protocols be designed to accommodate that likelihood? The question is, um, comes to where, you know, yeah, I think a trauma-sensitive hospice and palliative care is, I think, a good baseline. But if you have somebody bouncing in, in, in response to a particular kind of care, then um, uh, just like with any other kind of treatment, you know, knowing how to pinpoint that particular you know, like I said, just talking to somebody and doing bi bilateral stimulation, even if it's the fact that, like, w one of the hospice workers was, was talking with a woman who was furious that her son did life-saving measures and saved her life, and now she was stuck in hospice in really lousy shape. She was really mad at him. And doing, you know, it happens. And so being able to do specific you know, counseling level, pal you know, targeted pal palliation. And he just, he was tapping her feet while, while, while she was talking about it. And uh, the staff reported that she improved in terms of general irritability. Um, Maybe there's a set of um, red flags people could watch for in, in the short term, rather than history may not be rather irrelevant. You know, if they start to show this pattern of symptoms and then you start the EMDR or you start another protocol and maybe assume there's trauma. Maybe not, maybe the trauma is just as you said, it's just been accumulated recently as a result of being older, having chronic So asking if they've been in the ICU. Asking if they've been intubated. Asking, you know, because I don't remember asking that. Um, it's not a standard question. But if so many of the people are bouncing as a function of just being in the ICU. And the cancer people are going to have a different set of symptoms and sensitivities than the hemod you know, than maybe the you know, the ICU people or the hemodialysis people or so forth. Uh, people with, with cardiac issues, um, you know, people with, with pulmonary issues and their lungs are filling up. But you can't breathe, and it's really scary. Um, so working, you know, to, to some extent it's going to have to be targeted, but that's why the trauma-informed piece. I think there's going to be some questions that you have to ask. Do you just assume all women have been raped and all men haven't? Everybody's been raped? You know, what, um, it needs to be thought about, and, and some way to do it in a way that, that – um, is, is thoughtful. And yeah, having trauma sensitivity across the board where you can say, holy cow, we have a really, compa uh, and in nursing homes, I would really like to see this kind of thing go, go into a nursing home. We have a really combative, demented person who's pinching and biting and slapping. Um, there's some lovely case studies of people doing EMDR with demented people, but, but they had to get some history on what was going on, and then they could do EMDR around some, some targeted memory pieces. So it's, it's um, so yeah, both trauma sensitivity and also trauma-informed work and the ability to do direct trauma pal palliation. You don't do cancer radiation therapy with every hospice patient. And you know, so so it makes sense to do it in a targeted way. Not everybody's got a tr tumor to shrink, if that made sense. It's after one. You know, I don't want to keep you guys. Uh, if there's any more questions, I'll I'll be here. Am I as speaker allowed to like end this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>